ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه وخليله ارسله الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا اما بعد the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said والذي نفس محمد بيده لو تعلمون ما اعلم لا بكيتم كثيرا ولا ضحكتم قليلا he said, I swear by the one in whose hands Muhammad's soul is in, if you knew what I knew, you would laugh less and cry more. Shakespeare said, thus does knowledge makes cowards of us all. The more knowledge that you have, the more difficult it becomes for you to enjoy life. And alhamdulillah, the Prophet sallallahu we don't know what he knew regarding the hereafter, regarding the things that await us. However, he shared some of the, that information with us, and the little bit that he shared with us, كَقَطَرَ النَّدَى It's like a drop of morning dew. Nothing in comparison to what he actually knew, because we wouldn't be able to enjoy life had he exposed to us what he actually knew what was going to happen in the hereafter. Inshallah ta'ala, tonight I want to talk to myself first and foremost and to the rest of the jama'ah about a trial that is awaiting us that every single individual from amongst us will have to go through. And the trials and tribulations that we go through in this life prepare us for the trials and the tribulations that await us in the hereafter. And one of the greatest trials that awaits us is what is known as Al-Ubur al is our journey across the bridge over the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًا That there's none from amongst you except that you have to go across this bridge over the hellfire. None from amongst you except that you have to go across this bridge. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Al-thabat ala sirat al-mamdood fawq al-jahannam yawm al-qiyamah bi qadri al-thabat ala sirat al-mustaqeem fi al-dunya wa ala qadri sayrihi ala hadihi al-sirat يَكُونُ سَيْرُهُ عَلَىٰ تِلْكَ الصَّلَاةِ إِنْتَهَا كَلَامُهُ رَحِمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ Ibn Qayyim رحمه الله تعالى He says that your thabah, your firmness in going across the bridge over the hellfire will be depending on your firmness on the sirat al-mustaqeem in this life. So based upon how steadfast you were on the sirat al-mustaqeem in this dunya, will determine how firm you are going across the sirat over the hellfire. And this concept of being dealt with in the hereafter, how you carried yourself in this life, can be found in many ayats in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي هَذِهِ أَعْمَى فَهُوَ فِي الْآخِنَةِ أَعْمَى وَأَضَلُّ السَّبِيلَ so whoever was blind in this life will be blind in the hereafter and even further astray. And in another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to the individual who questions Allah, believing that this is some sort of injustice. And he questions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why am I blind in the hereafter when I could see in the dunya? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُمْ عِيشَةً ضَنْكًا وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمًا 
قال ربي لما حشرتني أعمى وقد كنت بصيرا قال فذلك أتتك آياتنا فنسيتها فكذلك اليوم تنسى and whoever turns away from my remembrance in this life, he will have a life narrowed down, a life restricted. These are the individuals who have everything that the dunya can offer, but empty inside, which is why many of them commit suicide. Empty. You will have a life narrowed down, and we will raise you yawm al a'ma, blind. An individual will turn to Allah and say, Ya Rabbi, lima hasharatini a'ma? Why did you raise me a blind when I used to see in the dunya? And Allah will say to the individual, wa kadharika atatka ayatuna fa nasitaha. When my verses, when my signs, when my warnings came to you, you ignored them, so today you will be ignored. You prayed when you wanted to pray. You fasted when you wanted to fast. You got up for fajr when you wanted to get up for fajr. Just like you ignored my signs, my ayats, my warnings, you will be ignored. So this concept, and there's other verses that deal with other concepts, the same concept, driving home the same point, that as you do in this dunya, that is how you will be dealt with in the hereafter. And although the religion of Al-Islam is the final religion for mankind, the Prophet Sallallahu community, the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be the first to be held accountable on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, نَحْنُ آخِرَ الْأُمَّمْ وَأَوَّلُ مَنْ يُحَاسَبْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَقَالُوا فَيُقَالُوا أَيْنَ أُمَّةِ الْأُمِّيَّةِ وَالنَّبِيُّهَا فَنَحْنُ آخِرُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ فَنَحْنُ the Prophet said that we are the last community, the last religious community, we will be the last, we are the last community, but we will be the first ones to be held accountable Yawm Al-Qiyamah. It will be said, where is the unlettered Ummah and its Prophet? Aina Al-Ummah Al-Ummiyya wa Nabiyyuha. Where is the unlettered Ummah and its Prophet? He said, فَنَحْنُ الْآخَرُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ So we are the last, but the first. We are the last of nations, but we will be the first to be held accountable in the Qiyamah. And the Prophet ﷺ gave a very detailed description of this day, whose length will be 50,000 years long. The day, Yom Qiyamah, one day, will be equivalent to 50,000 years. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, تَعْرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ وَرْرُوحُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ فَاصْبِرْ صَبْرًا جَمِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the angels, on a day when the angels and the spirit will ascend up to him in a day whose equivalent will be 50,000 years. فَاصْبِرْ صَبْرًا جَمِيلًا So be patient with a beautiful patient. Yom Al-Qiyamah will be 50,000 years long, one day. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned in the authentic hadith, he given us a description of this day. He said, أَنَا سَيِّدُ النَّاسِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَجْمَعَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى النَّاسِ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ فِي سَعِيدٍ وَاحِدٍ He said that Allah, he said, I will be the best of mankind on Yom Al-Qiyamah. On the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather the first of creation and the last creation on one flat plane. Everyone standing on one flat plane. And the sun will be brought a mile's distance. Right now the sun is light years away from us and on the hottest day we sweat profusely. Can you imagine the sun being brought a mile's distance? And some people will say, well, how is that even humanly possible that we could stand a mile's distance from the sun? Well, the scholars, they explain that Yom Al-Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will return us back to our original sizes. 60 cubits, 94 feet tall, which was the original size of Adam, alayhi salam. So we will not be 
as small and as tiny as we are today. You have human male men, two feet, three feet tall. They're called midgets, right? But that wasn't the original stature of the human being. Adam السلام, was 60 cubits tall. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Prophet وسلم, mentioned in the hadith, that that was the original stature of man, and his stature had to be continued to decrease, decrease all the way up until Yom al Qiyamah due to the sins of mankind. But we will be returned back to our original sizes. So it's possible, being that big, we might be able to withstand the heat of the sun. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, And people on that day will be filled with so much fear and anxiety on that day that we can't even describe to you the fear and the anxiety that they will experience on that day. And people will stand in that place, stand in their sweat based upon the deeds that they did in this life. He said, the Prophet وسلم, said that some people will stand in their sweat Yom al Qiyamah up to their ankles. Some people will stand in their sweat and it will come up to their knees. Some people will stand in their sweat and it will come up to their waist. Some people will stand in their sweat and it will go and they will be drowning in their own sweat. The sweat will go into their mouths. And the Prophet وسلم, pointed to his mouth to demonstrate it. In another narration, the Prophet وسلم, said that a man will drown in his sweat. And this is not something that is far fetched because sweating is associated, or perspiration is associated with anxiety and fear, even in this life. When you are in fear or you're anxious about something, right? You sweat underneath your arms, your head, your back starts to sweat. So we can kind of understand and we can make the connection here, even with the stress that we associate that, that is associated with sweating in this life. He said, but some people will be drowning in their sweat, Yom al until they will tell Allah, oh Allah, just throw me in the hellfire so I don't drown anymore in my sweat. Just throw me in the hellfire. But there will be some people that will be shaded on this day with the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while everyone else is standing in the dead heat of the sun. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the authentic hadith, Sabatu, you did the fi dilli arshihi yawma la dilla illa dillu. That there will be seven people that will be shaded on the, with the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day where there will be no shade except the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those seven, I'll run through them very quickly. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Imam al-Adil is an imam, a leader, someone in a position of authority. It doesn't just mean the imam over the Muslims or the imam of the masjid, but you are the imam of your home. You are the imam, you are in charge, you are responsible for anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you responsible for. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Man Allah wa abdan. The Prophet said that Allah never places a servant over an affair and then he neglects to give that affair its due right, except that he will not smell the fragrance of paradise. It doesn't matter what position you are put in charge of, you are the imam over that position. And if it involves other people, then it definitely the, the, the responsibility is even greater because you have a responsibility not to oppress people. Imam al-Adil says that imam or a leader who is just and fair. The next one, shabu nasha'a fi ibadatillah is a young man who was raised on obedience to Allah, upon worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is what Shaykh Abdullah was mentioning earlier during this time. Keep your children close to you. 
Because the child that is raised upon obedience to Allah, raised on ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for hariyun and yistamirru then it is more likely that he will continue the rest of his life like this. Because the children will follow the path of his parents in most instances. Which is why when Maryam came with the child Jesus, they said to her, Ma kana abu in wa ma kana How could you do this? Your mother wasn't known to be licentious, nor was your father known to be promiscuous. How could this happen? They couldn't even fathom that she could do something like that because her parents were not known to be like that. The parents become the standard. But it's a young man who was raised on obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a, a, a man whose heart is attached to the masjid. And unfortunately today we have played the role of shaitan because we have chased the young people away from the masjid. We have chased people away from the masjid. The masjid should be a fortress. The masjid should be a, a sanctuary. A masjid should be a place where people come to get cured of their illnesses not a place for perfect people who do not let people who are diseased or have illnesses in. Because that's the attitude that we have with the masjid now. That this is only a place for righteous people and people who are not righteous have no place here. The Prophet Sallallahu when the man came and urinated in the masjid, did the Prophet chase him away? He said, no, let him finish. And then he explained to the man that this place is not a place for urination and defecation. It was, it was, it, these places were built for the remembrance of Allah, for the recitation of Quran and for Salah. And when the Prophet وسلم, took the time out to explain to this man, he said, He said, Oh Allah, have mercy on me and Muhammad, and don't have mercy on anybody else. Meaning the Sahaba who was getting ready to beat them up for urinating in the masjid. This is the paying it forward. When you have mercy upon someone, they show it back to you. The Prophet said, <laughs> Those who are merciful, the most merciful will have mercy on them. Show mercy to those who are on the earth, and the one that is above the heavens will have mercy upon you. He said, Oh Allah, have mercy upon me and Muhammad, and don't have mercy upon anyone else. But a rajul. A man whose heart is attached to the masjid. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَظْنَبُ مِمَّنْ مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِي هَسْمُ وَالزَّعَافِ خَرَابِهَا And who can be more oppressive than the one who prevents people from coming to the masjid? Who can be more, more oppressive than that? وَهَا that. And here we are, that's our role today. We oppress people. We prevent people from coming to the masjid to get cured. And as the scholar mentioned in the line of poetry, Tasifu Dawa, the Di Sakami wa the Dana, came at to sit with Bihi wa anta sakimu, that you passing out remedies to everybody else while you sick. Here it is, you giving everybody else the remedy, but you the one that's sick. We all in here sick. We all here for the same reason. So why don't we make it so difficult upon the young people who come to the masjid? Okay, they come to the masjid with their pants sagging. Okay, they come to the masjid and their pants are dragging on the ground. But they hear. They hear. Okay, they don't come to the masjid for Salatul Fajr. We come up with titles and nicknames Jumu'ah Muslims. Right? They hear for Jumu'ah. Take advantage of the opportunity that they hear because they may walk out of these doors and get, make it murdered in the streets. Make it wiped and get, get swiped away by shaitan. Anything can happen to them. Take advantage of them while they're here. Not criticize them for being here and chase them away. But who can be more oppressive than the one who prevents people from the houses of Allah and from remembering the name of Allah and works diligently for the destruction of the mischief? And we have to define our roles. What are we here for? What are we doing? But a man whose heart is attached to the mischief and two people who love each other for the sake of Allah, they come into the religion loving each other for the sake of Allah, and they don't part from that until one of them leaves this dunya. Showing you that the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how much we dislike one another, no matter how much we don't agree with one another, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never goes away. Never goes away. But some of us have a false understanding of love, so we toss it away the moment someone disagrees with us. 
because you don't understand what love is. And these will probably be the same individuals who would divorce their families, divorce their wives, or vice versa. The woman asks for a divorce from her husband the moment there's a disagreement because you don't understand what love is. Love is a commitment. It's not something that you know you just give to someone you know as long as they agree with you or at the convenience of you know them agreeing with you. But two men who love each other for the sake of a law, they unite upon that and they don't separate except upon that. Meaning when one of them leaves this dunya, and another man is a one who a woman who is of a high social status and is beautiful and she calls him to commit zina and he says, indeed I fear Allah. I fear Allah. Right? And another one is a man who gives sadaqah so secretly that his left hand doesn't know what his right hand gives. And the last one is a man, Rajulun, Nakhdar Allah Khadi and Fafawat Aynahu, is a man who remembers Allah, remembers Allah in seclusion by himself and his eyes well up with tears. And there are others that will be shaded on the day when there will be no shade except the shade of Allah. There's only seven mentioned in that hadith, but there are other hadith that mention others that will be shaded, like the individual owner of Mujahid, like the one who assists the Mujahid, who's fighting the peace of the Ilah, Tahseen al Khuluq, the one who beautifies his character, Wal Mashi in al Masjid, the one who walks to the Masjid. And a tajir a saduk, and the one, a businessman who was honest and trustworthy. Wa al makatid, and the one who assists the individual who uh, wants to earn his freedom. Wa anzar al mursir, and the one who it makes it easy for a person to pay him back what he owes him. Meaning, you loan someone something, and when you go to collect what with, with the person owes you, you take whatever he can give you. And you don't make it difficult upon him. This is another individual who will be shaded by the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha tadakkarat yawm al-qiyama fabakat fasa'alaha nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mada biki ya Aisha. Faqalat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha tadakkarat yawm al-qiyama fahal sanadkar aba'ana. Ya Rasulullah, hal sanadkar aba'ana. Hal sanadkar ahabib habibatahu. فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نعم إلا في ثلاثة مواضع. عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها. She's sitting down pondering and reflecting on some of the scenes of يوم القيامة as she began to cry. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم asked عائشة why are you crying? She said, O Messenger of Allah, يوم القيامة will we remember our fathers? Meaning when we're in that mokif and that we're in that place about to be judged. <laughs> naked, uncircumcised, waiting for judgment. Will we see people that we will recognize? Will we recognize our mothers and our fathers? She said, will a man who loves his wife, will he recognize his own wife? The Prophet Wasallam said, yes, except in three situations. Except in three situations. Number one, قَالَ نَعْمْ إِلَّا فِي ثَلَاثَ مَوَاضِرِ إِنَّ الْمِزَانِ لَمَّا يَرْقُلِ الْعَمَلِ he said, number one is when you your deeds are being weighed, whether they are light or they are heavy, you won't worry about anybody that you knew in this dunya at the time that your deeds are being weighed. That when your deeds are weighed, if they are light or if they are heavy, you're not going to care about anybody that you knew in this dunya. He said, number two, the second place, and the When you are receiving your book, even your right hand or in your left hand, you're not going to care about who you knew in the dunya. The most important thing to you at that moment is which hand you are receiving your book in. He said, in the third place, that you will not care about who you loved in the dunya and who you knew in the dunya in your sirat when you were going across the bridge over the hill. And every time you listen to Aisha's questions, you can always see a very human side to her. Who's thinking about whether or not you want to remember people that you knew your mother? She's sitting down and she's contemplating. If a man and a woman love each other in this dunya, does that love just dissipate because now we're transitioning to the hereafter? Or do we still have love for people that we knew in the dunya? Will we see people? 
people that we will recognize, you're from Myanmar. This is a very human side that Aisha, you know, brings out when she asks these type of questions. And the Prophet Sallallahu obliged her. However, the Prophet Sallallahu he gave us a description of the bridge over the hellfire. He said, Yudrahu, Jisru Jahannam fa akunu awwalu man yajizu, wa dua al rusul yawma idin rabbi sendim sendim. The Prophet Sallallahu said that the bridge will be laid over the hellfire. And I will be the first one to go across the bridge. And the dua, the supplication of the prophets on that day will be, O Rabbi, send them, send them. O oh Allah, give them safety going across the bridge. O oh Allah, give these are the prophets making dua for us, the messengers making dua for us going across the bridge. And the Prophet said, There will be hooks made out of fire on the bridge. That will be there, obviously, to snatch people off of the bridge. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, uh, 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 Abu Sa'id al Khudri, he said, Balaghani annahu addakum min al sha'ar wa ahadu min al sayyid. He said that it reached me that the bridge over the hellfire is as thin as a hair and as sharp as a blade. And the scholars, they explain, Al Sirat, addakum min al sha'ar wa ahadu min al sayyid wa ahra min al jambri. The scholars, they explain that the bridge over the hellfire is as thin as a hair, as sharp as a blade, as hot as a piece of coal. It is slippery. No feet, no, no foot will be able to be firm on this bridge except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Which is why Allah says in the Quran, يُثَبِّتُ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّالِثِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَيُذِلُّ اللَّهُ الظَّالِمِينَ That Allah will make firm with the word that is firm, meaning لا إله إلا الله The word that is firm in this life as well as in the hereafter. But the bridge over the hellfire will be slippery. It will have hooks on it that will be made out of fire and it will be dark. It will be very dark going across this bridge. And underneath the bridge is what? The hellfire. The hellfire that the Prophet said that Allah will take an individual. And I'm in the dunya. Will take an individual who had every luxury the dunya could offer. And he will take him and dip him in the hellfire. Just dip him in the hellfire. Pull him out and ask him, has he ever known any good? And he will say, no. I have never known any good. Just one dip in the hellfire is enough to make him forget a whole life full of opulence and luxury and good life and good living. One dip in the hellfire. So what do you think about a person who will be yanked off the bridge by the hooks and thrown into the hellfire? We're talking about a man that's just dipped into the hellfire. It's just enough to make him forget every good that he had experienced in the dunya. And so let's take a look at what this hellfire underneath the bridge, what it looks like. How deep is it? How wide is it? Abdullah bin Abbas, he said to some of his companions, Atadruna masa'ata jahannam, kunna la, kala ajal, wallahi ma tadruna, anna ma bayna shahmati udhuni a'adihim, wa anfihi masirat sab'in kharifa, yani sanat. يَجْرِ فِيهِ أَوْدِيَةُ الْقَيْحِ وَالْدَّمِ Abdullah bin Abbas, he said, do you know how wide the hellfire is? So they said, no, we don't know. He said, I know you don't. I'll tell you. Just to give you an example, I'm not even going to tell you how wide it is. I want to tell you how big the people in the hellfire is, and that will give you an idea of how wide it is. He said, the individual in the hellfire the distance between his earlobe and his nose, right here. The distance between his earlobe and his nose is enough for a rider on the fastest riding horse to cover a distance of 70 years. <coughs> the distance between his earlobe and his nose is 70 years on a fast riding animal. That's just to show you how big the people in the hellfire will be. Because there's no way that we can actually even understand or grasp.